Hello and welcome to another episode of AI Inside, the show where we take a look at the AI hiding inside of everything. Sometimes the AI that we're talking to. So, you know, it's, it's hiding inside the voice on the other end of the line. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that in today's show. I'm Jason Howell, joined as always by my co-host Jeff Jarvis. Hello, sir. Hello. And actually, right now, Jason is somewhere in Italy enjoying <laughs> wonderful food. And uh, we could. I hope I'm enjoying yeah. wonderful food. Oh, well, yeah, actually, absolutely. so. Okay, so if it's 11 a.m. Pacific, what time is it in Italy? I could be sleeping right now. Yeah, it's, it's uh, no. the clock is not my friend at this point. The, the time <laughs> zones are so completely different. But I am enjoying the first part of yes. my trip. So thank you for mentioning that, Jeff. Uh, this week and the next two episodes, no live show if, if that's your preference. Uh, but we will have episodes. We have pre-records with some really interesting people uh, doing really interesting things in the world of AI, as is the case today. But before we get started, just want to throw a big thank you to those of you who support us on Patreon, because that support drives the success of this show. Patreon.com slash AI Inside Show. Brett and one of our newest patrons, Charles Gillogly. Gillogly? I'm sorry if I mispronounced it, but... I think you're awesome nonetheless, and thank you for supporting us. Patreon.com slash AI Inside Show. Uh, like I say every time, we couldn't do the show without you. All right, so the last handful of weeks, I mean, th this has been a topic that's come up on the show many times, regardless of the last handful of weeks. But I feel in, in the last, you know, the previous month or so, we've seen a lot of examples that have really highlighted, or a lot of news that have really highlighted examples of how... AI is becoming much more conversant from a voice communication perspective. You know, we see a lot of these multimodal systems like Project Astra that Google showed off at Google I.O., um, ChatGPT, GPT 4.0, you know, all these things seem to really lean into uh, voice conversation with AI as a pretty critical point of the experience. And so we've, you know, certainly tackled that topic on the show, uh, many times over the last handful of months. And, uh, we have the opportunity to bring on someone who is working closely with a lot of this technology. Not only that has a pretty cool resume and I've been following Justin's work uh, for quite a while. Justin Uberti is the co-founder and CTO of Fixie. Um, it, Justin, it's really great to have you here. Thank you for joining us today. No, it should be fun. Yeah, this is going to be great. I just want to kind of like set the stage a little bit because I, I started following you, I think, on, on Twitter and possibly even Google Plus because that was what Google did back then. Um, when you <laughs> were at Google, I know, right? When, when Google thought everything needs to have Google Plus tendrils uh, in it, um, you, were, you founded WebRTC while at Google, which is a really big accomplishment. Um, you drove the development of uh, the products like uh, Hangouts Video, Duo, Stadia. So, I, yeah, I've been following your work and and reading you on on Twitter and all other places for quite a while. So it's a it's a real treat to get you here today. Appreciate your time. Thanks. And also, here. I should also mention also at Clubhouse, you were at Clubhouse for a little while before co-founding Fixie.ai and becoming uh, the CTO of the company as well. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so. Given all of that, your work at Fixie has you focused on a number of things AI related, but um, I think the thing that really caught my attention was the voice enabled AI aspect of what you're doing. We'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, AI.town in a moment. Um, really feels like this moment in artificial intelligence, we're on the cusp of some very interesting advancements in voice AI. Things are getting a lot more human when you, when we can, you know, see these examples of talking to AI with our voice, it used to be like, Oh yeah, you can do that. But there's, there's evidence that, you know, it's, still a machine. And I would, I would say that there's still evidence, but there's a lot less evidence of that now. So you're keeping your, yourself at the cutting edge uh, through your career uh, and, and you're doing this now. Tell us a little, bit about, a little bit about how your previous experience, Google and everything prior and after, has led you to the work that you're doing with Fixie and with, uh, with uh, AI.town. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, and, and I think that's actually a pretty good setup. Of I, I've been sort of very like just interested in this area for for a long time uh, of the notion that you know, hey, I, something's different about conversing with audio and video 
than, than just over text. And, and hmm. even text, I worked on AOL Instant Messenger. That was like the first thing I did, like, you know, when I just kind of joined the industry. And I thought that was like magical. Uh, the fact that you could just send a message and it would instantly appear somewhere else, like uh, across the world, like um, immediately. Um, mm-hmm. But as, as time went forward, the notion that we could then add audio and video to that mix and just the additional sort of like weight that that, that media carried. I think what we're seeing right now with apps like Instagram, TikTok, they're all going kind of video centric because it's just the much a much more salient medium. That, that there's just something like a little bit more that hits a little different, as we like to say at, at Clubhouse, uh, about things like voice that are, that are different than 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 just reading. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, chat rooms have been around for a long time, and at Clubhouse we saw that just the impact of you know people being able to sit around and, and almost like just like you know shoot you know shoot the bull you know to, to just talk. And just the value that, that that provided of just that hearing a familiar voice and just hearing people laugh as you, as you talk and these sort of things. And, and I think that's just something that's not present in, in a text-only communication. Mm-hmm. So describe what you're doing at Fixie. So, you know, our, our thesis then is sort of the same that when we look at ChatGPT, an amazing accomplishment, you know, the ability to type in really almost anything and get out and like, you know, a, a very human sounding response. Uh, but it still sort of feels in many ways, you, you have a new command line and you type in text, you get out text. And when I talk to people who are sort of outside the AI bubble, outside the industry about are using chat GPT, a lot of times the answer I get back is, uh, I don't know what the type. Hmm. <laughs> so yeah. common. Oh yeah. I've heard that so many times. And actually I felt that too. When I was first stepping into AI, I was like, I know this is powerful, um, but I have no idea what I'm going to use it for. And all it took was for me to continue to almost, almost force myself to, to, to turn to it first for things that would bubble up. And then it started to become really clear to me. Yeah. Right. Uh, but I, I think that it's just a little bit alien. Uh, I mean, first of all, talking to a, this AI, but the, just the, the overall interaction mechanism, it, it's different than the way most people prefer to interact. And I, I think that's the thing that we saw such uh, you know, on, on Duo, on Google Meet, that when people want to have an important conversation, when convenience isn't top of mind, the modality they want is either in person or, or, or voice and video. And, uh, you know, just the impact of the pandemic and seeing, you know, the, the use of meat and similar tools to show like the value of that kind of live synchronous communication. And so it's no surprise then to think when we talk to AIs, shouldn't we expect the same sort of thing? Shouldn't we expect that, you know, the modality that humans are given with, born with, the ability to speak, everybody can speak almost. And uh, it's just like a much richer way of interacting there's not just the textual content of what you're saying, but all these, uh, you know, things of tone of voice and like things that are sort of you're familiar, you know, what does your voice sound like? Can you be known just from the first words you say of who it is because of like that unique timbre that your voice has? And, uh, you know, in, in, in the speech domain, we call these paralinguistic cues. And I, I think it just leads to a thing where the, the voice just, it, it, it almost it's like it's processed at a different level in your mind. It sort of hits a little differently and it's much more familiar. It's much more engaging. And, and I think that, you know, we're now at the cusp of this, uh, you know, basically time when AIs now will have the ability to, to really interact, uh, you know, using like speech and, and I think eventually uh, embodiment and vision. And so at Fixie, you know, we're basically creating, uh, you know, some of the tools to kind of really empower this sort of technology for AIs to really interact uh, you know, just as naturally with voice as, as talking to another human. And we're trying to figure out, you know, can AIs tell jokes? Can they be funny? Can they be witty? Can they be zany? And uh, AI Town is a place where you can kind of interact with these AIs and, uh, you know, have these experiences over voice. You know, it, 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 so I'm going to, pardon me for a plug for a moment. I wrote a book called The Gutenberg Parenthesis, which is really about the age of print and text as an exception. And we, and before society was conversational and then it became dominated by, by text. And I think we're returning to a conversational society now. And it's, it's in fits and starts. Uh, when, when radio came, newspapers insisted that, that the ear was not a good way to learn things, that it had to be through the eye because of course newspapers made text for the eye. And, and so I think we're coming, you know, kind of full bore 
but we're out of practice and <laughs> we don't know how to do this, I, I think, as, as a group. And so I wonder whether there are, um, do, do you think people have to relearn how to have conversations, uh, whether it's with themselves or machines? Uh, I, I think that it's it's still people ha ha have a sense of, you know, when they interact with their friends, they interact with like their family, like they, they, they talk. And, and so, mm -hmm. you know, but to talk to a computer, like uh, I, I think that's a little bit of, of, of a chasm to be crossed, but I think it's not a big mm -hmm. one. Uh, you know, when we were starting Fixie, uh, you know, I heard from people who basically said, Justin, I, I don't think people want to talk to their computer. Uh, and, and I said to them, look, you're, you're talking to your computer two, three hours a day. And Just they said, the fingers. Well, you're right. Well, they're, they're saying like, you know, I, oh, no, I'm not talking to my computer. I'm talking to the other person on the other end of the call, my Zoom or uh, Teams call or, or, or whatever. I'm not talking to my computer. And, and, and I said, well, but imagine on the other side, it's an AI. It's the same sort of thing. Like you're not talking to your, you could say you're not talking to the computer. You're talking to the, the, the thing that actually, uh, you know, is the, having, you're having a conversation with. You're having a conversation with this AI or this intelligence or this thing that's helping you or coaching you or, or serving as a companion, and uh, you know you're going to think about that the same way that you know you do a Zoom call you know, in a couple of years. I think it's just uh, you know people can they can talk much faster than they can type, and there's just much more information communicated uh, in in voice than than in like typing out a text message. Hmm. Yeah, what what kind of comes to mind for me as we're talking about um, all of this in the context of video conferencing, you know, uh, apps, which actually you've you've had a lot of experience with with online video conferencing with with Hangouts Video and Duo and everything, is that what I'm starting to see now with AI in chat apps is here's an extra like if we're in a group. And we we are humans chatting with humans. Here's an AI that's also part of the group that brings that extra intelligence that that appears like another human in the group that you can integrate and, and pull in. And it almost seems like vo with voice AI kind of hitting the point to where we're getting to this place where it really does sound human and is really great at at parsing the conversation and potentially being an assistant there with you that we're not too far from that AI voice being a part of our conversation, like our actual conversations on a group in a group sense online and being essentially another collaborator right there that we can use our voice to communicate with. I, I don't think we're very far from that. It, maybe it's already happening and I just haven't seen it. Uh, I, I think that, you know, absolutely uh, th these things are happening. And I would say that the, uh, you know, the, the voice part is actually probably coming along a little faster than the, uh, you know, assistant part. And, and, and the point mm -hmm. that I'm trying to make here is that we often expect our assistants to go take actions on our behalf. Mm -hmm. And I, I think one of the things that current AI struggles with is the lack of a sort of internal review process or whatever, or thinking about, you know, is this the right thing to be doing? And as a result, I think we're uncomfortable by asking AIs to go take actions for our, our, our on our behalf, especially actions that are irreversible, like sending an email or, or even sometimes even like scheduling or things like that, because uh, they always want you to review it to make sure, oh, mm -hmm. did the AI make a mistake or not? Mm -hmm. But one thing that the AI doesn't tend to make mistakes in is in dialogue. Uh, these AIs, they're large language models and, and the language part, like this is what they're trained to do is, is to really talk and sound like they're a human because they've been trained on these enormous volumes of text. And so they're very good at conversation and conversation also has this nice property where it's naturally self-healing. Humans mishear things all the time <laughs> in conversation. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, right. And, and like, you know, the conversation doesn't stop, doesn't lead to like the wrong thing happening. You say, say what? Or I, or is that true? Mm -hmm. Or I, I didn't catch that? Or, oh, I thought you meant that. Like, there's all these natural ways where a conversation, if it starts to go off the rails, can be brought back on just by the fact it's a two-way uh, exchange of information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me ask the obvious question, which you know I'm going to ask about anthropomorphization, especially after uh, GPT-4.0 and, and the hubbub around Scarlett Johansson, but really more about the... Um, the, the question of, uh, and this is from the stochastic parrots paper too, when people are fooled is, is, is getting people to believe that they're talking to a human, the goal peril, uh, what's the ethical 
structure that that you want to create around this technology that you're that you're creating. I mean, our, our view is, is that uh, you know this sort of wave is coming. But I, I think that you know, the right way to, to, to experiment with it and, and understand it is in a low stakes environment uh, where it's, it's primarily for, you know, chit chat and, and, and entertainment purposes. And that's kind of what we've done with, with our site, AI.town. Uh, you know, we, we're basically creating this environment where you can talk with a number of, of different AI personalities. And, uh, you know, the conversation is, is the key aspect. You know, these AIs, they'll, they'll actually have their own sort of lives. They'll make social media posts. You can text them. You can you know, have a, a you know voice call them, and uh, you know there, we've gotten a number of really great reactions uh, you know f- from people interacting with this sort of stuff. And so uh, you know in terms of anthropomor- anthropomorphization, you know do we worry about you know people ascribing uh, sentience or consciousness to these AIs? Like, well, no, because like it, it's clearly sort of set up here in an entertainment sort of structure. Uh-huh. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we, I, I think that's the right way to kind of like edge into this technology and, and see where things go. But you're, you're, you're the front and I'm not trying to lead you here, uh, honestly, but I think that you, because you're, you are a leader in this and a pioneer in this, um, I'm not one who engages in moral panic. I'm not one who gets all worried about it, but I am fascinated by, uh, and I also think it's too early in many ways to set standards because we don't know what this stuff can do. Nonetheless, you're at the you're at the early edge of this, and you have an opportunity, I think, to um, uh, define. So, so I, I'm, I'm trying to hesitate not from doing this. I'll do it. What's bad use of this technology? Uh, I mean, I think I think there's some pretty obvious immediate harms that one could point out of you know cloning people's voices and using them to defraud others. Right. I think that's something that is going to be, uh, you know, something that people will be very conscious uh, uh, across the industry. And some of the leading sort of speech providers are already doing a lot to try to prevent this, watermarking the voices, uh, you know, insisting on consent and like you know, even forms of consent where you have to make a video and hold up an ID. Uh, you know, I, I think there are there are real challenges around this. I do think we have some legal structures to, to deal with this. But you know, to be honest, uh, I, I think there was a point in time where people sort of felt you could trust something that was like published text and say, Oh, mm-hmm. if this text, you know, I show it to someone, I can believe that that's what this person actually said. Well, we know like that, that's no longer the case. Uh, we're also getting to the case where you can't really believe that a photo, you know, is, is necessarily actually a photo of a real event that occurred, you know, with, with generative AI. And there, there's some techniques for watermarking photos and everything. But I think that's an area where, again, most people probably don't believe photos, you know, have quite the same salience anymore. And I think we're probably getting to the same area with, with voice is that, uh, you know, because the voice cloning is, is certainly possible, uh, you, you can't say authoritatively that a recording that sort of sounds like person X is definitely person X. And so, like, you know, even stepping away from uh, you know, it, it, what, what should we think about people talking to AIs rather than other humans? Uh, which, you know, I, one could say is like really just like rediscovering the art of conversation. Yep. Uh, you know, I think that there's some more just obvious, you know, potential harms. And, and I think that, you know, the folks who are working in the space uh, have thought about this stuff very carefully uh, in terms of like, you know, how might some of these things be, be used and have put some defenses in already against that. Yeah, back to your point of print. Um, sorry, I'm going to nerd out from my, my print stuff. But when print started with movable type, it was not trusted because there was no provenance. Um, and anybody could make this pamphlet uh, like anybody can make a, a tweet, right? Uh, and we created institutions of editing and publishing and structure to to verify the authenticity. So I think that's the opportunity here is where do you get – your AI from? Where do you get your voice from? What's its provenance? What what does it know? What does it do? Who brought it to you? Are going to be important questions. And those are human questions. Yes. And those are opportunities. Mm. Yeah, indeed. Um, now you've mentioned the work that you're doing with AI Town, which you know I, I kind of showed it off. It's it's got a very colorful approach to it. It's it's almost like having well, it is. It's having virtual or actual spoken conversations. I guess you can text with with some of these characters as well. Um, 
I'm, I'm curious to know with, with these characters and you can actually go in there and you can create your own characters and kind of create a backstory for them. And yeah, it's a, it's a really cool kind of way to do this. Like you said, in a low stakes environment somewhere where you can kind of play around with the technology and what in my playing around with it, it kind of reminded me of not that I have a specific example to draw from, from when I was younger, when I was a kid playing with tech, you know, technology or games, you know, much, <laughs> much more rudimentary uh, games, but, but there was a little bit of like an, Oh, this is, this is fun. This is interesting. This is unexpected. Um, with all the different voices and the characters and everything like um, what is, what are some of the surprising, surprising things that you've seen from users as they begin to interact with some of these characters on the site? So, uh, you know, we first got a taste of this when we, uh, the first version of AI town was a holiday themed thing that we created called high Santa AI. And this was our sort of uh, idea of, Let's take some of the tech we've been building around making really lifelike voice interactions with, with AI and kind of use it to power Santa Claus and, and his friends. And we sort of put it out and thinking like, this will be an interesting thing to see if the models work, the service works, like do people actually like this? And our demand was way past what, what we expected. Uh, we ended up uh, you know, spending a lot of Christmas time kind of, you know, manning on call and turning up servers and, and things like that and talking to our various you know, providers. Uh, to make sure the stuff didn't fall over. And it, it sort of tapped into a, a couple of realizations. Uh, one being that, um, you know, people really enjoyed, you know, having some of these conversations to uh, you know, fictional characters. And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, when you think about like, what are, uh, you know, what are people using it for? There are many people who through print or you know, books, TV, movies, like there's fandoms, there's characters that people are really excited about and the opportunity to interact with them directly, ask questions about uh, their canon and stuff like that uh, is actually, you know, something that there, there's a lot of demand for. And it turns out, you know, Santa Claus is like a really popular fictional character. Uh, and so you, know, you have kids talking to, uh, oh, did, did I just uh, spoil the plot there? Uh, I, 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 there's kids talking to, to Santa Claus, but then there's adults talking to Santa Claus and this bad Santa character you have up here, a lot of conversations. And one of our most popular characters where bad Santa is like, a, well, I mean, you can read the, the sort of description there and you'll find me in the alley behind your local uh, rundown mall. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the question of can these thing, can these characters be, uh, the, we call them townies here in town. Can these townies, uh, be funny, you know, can they be witty and a little bit like, uh, you know, shoot off the cuff remarks and bad Santa definitely does. Like he can have some pretty awesome roasts. Uh, you can see just some of the things there. Um, yes, exactly. Um, and, and, and you know, people have long conversations with him and, uh, it, it's just the kind of thing where. Uh, you know, we, we wanted to just find some things where people could have a wholesome, you know, interesting conversation with, with, with some of these AI personalities and, and try to find out what are the, the places where you'd find actual like uh, resonance with, with what people are interested in talking about. And it turns out that the, the, these fictional characters are, are actually a pr pretty rich source of, uh, you know, enjoyment and, and uh, interesting conversations. What do you have to do to create the fictional character? How deep do you go in the yeah. description to make it uh, work as a character? Uh, so, you know, we, we have a lot, we have a setup flow that we've optimized, uh, you know, several times over, uh, you know, you can actually do it all through voice naturally, uh, and it asks you a few questions and it kind of helps build out the backstory. But we find that, uh, you know, one thing that LMs are really good at is role play. Uh, you say you are X, Y, Z, and you were born here and this is this and uh, you're interested in, in in this thing and you don't like this other thing. And the LM will just sort of run with it. And uh, we talk about hallucinations and, and LMs as, as like a bad thing. But when you're in this sort of uh, fictional AI character thing, a hallucination is a good thing because it's like, you know, oh, you know, what's my favorite food? What is my favorite food? Oh, my favorite food. Oh, I, I love steak tacos or whatever. And, and, and like they'll go and, and keep going, you know, and just at any, any time, just keep inventing new things uh, to sort of fill out the, their personality or keep the conversation going. And, you know, mindful that, you know, the online mindful that like it has to sort of stay in character uh, and, and, and not like, you know, forget things that are already said in the conversation. And it makes for a pretty interesting chit chat. 
Yeah, that that just um, that seems to point out the fact that like what you said about hallucinations, I think hallucinations related to AI, it's very, uh, very common to hear that be a negative connotation, but it really depends on the context, right? If it's if what we're looking for are facts, then a hallucination is actually a very bad thing. If what we're looking for is creativity, a hallucination could be an amazing thing because you don't know what it's going to give you. And to a certain degree, it mirrors what we as humans do in a certain sense when we're being creative. We're creating something out of nothing. And, you know, that isn't entirely always defined by a specific piece of information or anything that's directing us to do it. We just put a line there because it seemed like it would be a good idea or whatever, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The Guardian Absolutely. had a story a week ago or two weeks ago um, uh, arguing that – that. Um, AI could could cure the downward spiral of human loneliness. Mm -hmm. Do you have that highfalutin a goal, or is it more just fun? I mean, that's that that's a pretty pretty lofty bar there. Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but but to come back to you know the, the, the comment was made earlier of uh, you know have we lost the art of, of conversation? Uh, mm -hmm. through, you know, our phones and text messages. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think there could be something to be said for that of, uh, you know, one thing we, we've seen a use case uh, for, for AI town is uh, folks who speak English as a second language and uh, might not be fully comfortable, uh, you know, having a dialogue with somebody over English, but that you, you talk in a non-judgmental setting you know, with one of these characters and like, you can even ask them, point out mistakes if I make any mistakes. Uh, and they love it. And people have written in to tell us this on our Discord. That's that, fascinating. Uh, that is yeah. that is fascinating. That actually makes a ton of sense. Because I, you know, and my, and my my only example of this was, you know, a couple of decades ago when I was I knew I was going to live in Montreal for like six months. I didn't know French, and my girlfriend at the time, you know, we ended up getting some sort of CD-ROM that tells you about how when this was. But it was some sort of CD-ROM <laughs> that I used to try and learn French and everything. And they have you know had their own little exercises on how to speak and, you know, speak it out and, oh, you're wrong, you're right, or whatever. I don't, it wasn't doing any sort of voice recognition, obviously, at that time. But something like this would be incredibly useful. And it seems like the, it's the perfect application for these systems because they're very good at uh, at understanding the words that we're saying. Um, they're very good at, at, at translation. And, oh, that's, that's such a great tool. And you're that not, you're, you don't have a stage fright? Talking to well, it. yeah, you don't have to worry about being judged. That judgment piece isn't right. there because you're just because you know going in. Hopefully, you know going in that you're not actually talking to a humanized pickle. Uh, it's <laughs> you know what I mean. It's an AI. Yeah. <laughs> pickle P is great. It's one of our one of our yeah you know zaniest characters. But I, I think that not being judged is is an important part. Yeah, yeah I, I think that if we think about yes. the loneliness thing, I, I think that could be an, an important part of like people are afraid to like expose their real self uh, sometimes. And I think that, you know, having a confidant uh, where you could not be your, your real self without the thought of being judged, uh, you know, it seems like uh, just uh, I think that'd be naturally a net positive and help build confidence in that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Is is the town project a business or is it a, a demonstration of the power that you're creating? Uh, it's a business uh, in, in a few different ways. Uh, you know, there there are you know a number of, of partners we're talking to who have seen like this technology, and you say, "Wow, uh, you know, imagine that for our character X Y Z. Uh, we, we'd love to be able to enable that, or we'd oh. love to be able to put this technology inside you know this device or this other thing." Um, and without getting into the exact details, like uh, like there's definitely um, uh, a lot of interest in, in this just this conversational scenario. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can ma imagine just uh, a lot of potential things, um, you know, even just even <laughs> around, uh, you know, talking to Santa Claus and everything uh, where, like, you know, you, you could, you know, we forget sometimes in the industry that like, oh, this technology, oh, we'd build it. Like, uh, it, it still seems very magical to, 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 to an enormous amount of people. Yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, it's like the, my my wheels are are turning. You know, suddenly you can you, a jack in the box can come along and say, "Hey, you know, you can go to our site. You can actually have a conversation with Jack." And I'm I'm sure that's <laughs> if that's not happening already, uh, that's right on the other side of of, of you know of what corporations are going to think about doing because they want customers, they want people to engage with their with their brand in that way. This technology really encapsulates that. What are, what are some of the more 
kind of uh, challenging aspects of working with speech to speech models right now that maybe you didn't didn't foresee at, at this point in time? Oh man, uh, <laughs> yeah, we could go on for a, a long time about this. I, I think this is one of the reasons that uh, you know I think people have been maybe a real bit reluctant to fully dive in on speech is there, there are a lot of challenges uh, because the human ear is just such a good discriminator uh, mm -hmm. in terms of knowing like what sounds right, what sounds wrong. And you have, um, you know, one of the things that sounds wrong is when it takes the AI a long time to respond to you. Yes, uh, latency. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And so like within uh, the sort of duo and, and Google Meet and, and this sort of world, uh, you know, we had a very strict set of uh, standards of that, you know, we, we aim for, you know, 250 milliseconds, uh, you know, time between, you know, when you'd st stop speaking and the time the person on the other side of the call would hear it. Uh, and, and so, you know, this like very, very sub-second latency, uh, you know, was something that we, we sort of designed for the system, WebRTC, like a million you know, things went into that to make it more performant and, and really try to keep this natural, uh, you know, low, low latency sort of uh, thing built into the whole protocol. Because it turns out the humans... Uh, when they uh, have conversational turns, they alternate turns very, very quickly. And it depends on, on, on the language being spoken, but sort of for English, uh, the typical time between someone stops speaking and the time that the next person starts taking their turn is only about 200 milliseconds too. Hmm. So if you let your latency get up too high, uh, two things can happen. One is you can start having over-talking where somebody thinks that you know the, the person uh, you know, is, is done speaking Right, uh, but they're really not, and then they start, you know, talking, and, and, and the other person hasn't yet seated the floor, or, or or you can have things where there's a long delay in 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 uh, you know in, in voice, a long delay. You know, humans have interpreted as there's something about what I said that has is, isn't quite right, isn't sitting right with with, with the the listener, and maybe it's because they're thinking about it, or maybe they're thinking about how to deliver a response that's not going to you know be a hard message. But there's a very clear thing, and this is uh, documented in, in literature, that once it goes past about 600 milliseconds, uh, people start ascribing that that delay was intentional because there's some sort of additional thinking going on uh, that, that's being used to figure out how to say the thing they want to say. And so anyway, I, there, there's a lot more detail I could go into there. But I think the key thing is that the latency stuff isn't just like a nice to have. It makes everything just feel a little snappier. But it also changes like the overall semantic sort of feel of, of, of the conversation. So a lot of what we have built in terms of, oh, here's HTTP and all these sort of things that are meant for delivering web pages, those things uh, are not what we use for delivering voice. And so we use like WebRTC and this sort of technology because it's very focused around low latency. And I think the whole sort of like AI ecosystem is going to go through a bit of a forklift right now where it switches in out some of the existing you know, ways of doing things and switches in things that are more like WebRTC for getting to this low delay, quick response, conversational interaction. Well, that's certainly boss something once. that we saw. Oh, sorry. All right. Well, we just, we just demonstrated it. Um, yep. <laughs> I, I had a boss once who was, had very high latency. And I had to warn people who come into meetings, don't, don't finish the sentence for him. He'll finish it. Just get, you know, give it a minute. So it strikes me that you must be doing a lot of re reading, research, and research on the nature of human conversation. Yeah. Right. Are there any kind of interesting insights that you've had about us, not about the machine? Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, I, a couple of things I just mentioned there, but uh, you know, even the words like, uh, like, um, or, uh, you know, people sort of think of those, Oh, that's lazy speech. Those are things that, you know, when you don't know what to say, you insert them in, into your speech and you really, you should try to avoid using them at all. Well, it, it turns out that those things are really just part of a, a, of a protocol and that <laughs> really right. you're, you're sort of working to see, like, should I, um, am I keeping the floor open or not? I think that's really what it comes down to. Is the other person, should they speak? And by using um, um is just like a quick way of holding the floor for a little bit where uh, is holding the floor for a, a little bit longer, basically indicating that a response is going to be coming. Right. It, yeah, and, and so like, this little, you know, signaling happens on like almost unconsciously, but everyone knows how to do it. And they know like if someone says, um, they shouldn't start talking right away, even though like the, the time is now starting to accrue and, and delay since they, they stopped talking. And so uh, like, that's one interesting thing. And, and the other thing is that the sort of utterance, huh, uh, is, is itself like a, a special part of the protocol. 
that it turns out that huh is like the fastest thing that you can actually voice. And so if someone says something to you and you have a hard time understanding what's being said uh, and you spent you know, hundreds of milliseconds processing that, but you still haven't quite figured out what's going on, then rather than sort of like lose your time on the floor, people will say, huh, you know, as just a way of expressing, I didn't understand what you just said, almost like in a protocol term, what you would call like a negative acknowledgement or a knack. And then people sort of understand then that like uh, that the other, the speaker will then come back and maybe rephrase their their terms or whatever. But just, there's, there's a lot of little fascinating protocol like things that are already part of conversation that like I think unless you really start looking into in detail, it, it's easy to miss. That's that's fascinating Absolutely. to me, especially because I'm I'm also for the work that I'm doing in podcasting on an independent basis. I'm always looking for ways to, you know, kind of improve my productivity and shave off some time and everything. And of course, AI generated transcripts have been a huge like boon for me. Well, what I notice is going through the transcripts, those ums, those uhs. Those huhs, they carry a lot different meaning when you actually see it printed out in the transcript versus actually hear it. When you hear it, some like you said, it it makes sense. It connects two things. It keeps keeps the conversation going when you read it. Man, it just looks like that person just didn't know what they were talking about. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's a completely different meaning. <laughs> I, I remember. So, I, I one of the first interviews I did on on um, uh, on the media a show that's done out of NPR, uh, WNYC in New York. And as we're walking in the studio, the producer said, oh, I well, got to warn you, um, we edit Bob a lot. Uh, why, are you, why are you telling me this? I don't know what's going on. So what he did was he would restart sentences all the time, knowing that they were going to edit. And mm. not only that, but they did a fascinating episode. You might, might be interested in finding it. I can try to find it for you, where they do take out everybody's ums and uhs. They smarten you up. And there's a kind of a journalistic question there as to whether or not you're getting a true picture of someone or whether it's just a common courtesy that if you did a transcript of someone, you would probably delete the Oz because unless, unless you're trying to make them look stupid, it doesn't add anything. It's really interesting how we um, imbue some sense of someone's intelligence, um, mm -hmm. among other things, in how they speak. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like speaking on the spot, it, it can be quite challenging. Yeah. Uh, putting together a complex paragraph, there's not a processing required. And you're sort of, you start your utterance before you've even really fully figured out what it is you're going to say. And so you see a quote in a newspaper that's been sort of uh, all the errs, ums, filler words taken yes. out. And, and now to say to do the same for an actual sort of video or, or you know, an audio clip. Uh, it's doing the same sort of thing. But I, I think to your point, though, it, it, there's a lot more heavy lifting going on there because it's kind of starting to distort, you know, what was this person actually like in reality? What was the reality of the mm -hmm. thing versus what was like the sort of condensed product that the reporter had a chance to kind of smooth out? And yeah, uh, there, there's so a lot do of you add in those those human? I was just works? yeah, I was going to ask right, that. So too. when I listen to, to posh Brits, they say sort of sort of sort of a lot. We Americans say like or you know a lot. Right. Uh, there are certain kinds of pauses. Are you building that into the output? So this is probably a time to riff on the sort of V1 versus V2 uh -huh. in, in, in voice technology. And that uh, in many ways, uh, you know, what OpenAI demonstrated with GPT-40 uh, was what I consider to be sort of the V2 uh, of voice technology. They... Previously, uh, OpenAI had their own sort of uh, voice mode for, for ChatGPT. And the V1 is sort of where you have a speech recognition stage that turns speech into text, then the LLM stage, which is similar to what you're already seeing with ChatGPT, mm -hmm. and then finally a text-to-speech stage, which takes the output of the language model and turns it into, into speech. Now, in, in this world, like everything kind of gets converted to text run through the, the AI and then emitted back as a, a speech. And there's really no ums or errs in there because the, the language model doesn't think in that context. It's never really been trained. You probably could fine tune it to, to do so, but it doesn't think it's part of a voice conversation. And so these things don't occur naturally. In the V2 world, what we have is a model that consumes speech from the outside and emits speech on the other end. It's never forced into text uh, in, in the middle, like in the in the V1 setup. And in this mode, 
the the training is almost all you know to, to customize the model and make it uh, you know fully speech to speech enabled. It, it, it's speech, and in these artifacts of conversation, these filler words are part of the training data. And I expect you know will actually become part of this because, like I said, to participate in this conversational protocol, you need to be able to do these things. Although uh, you know maybe uh, you could say that the AI doesn't need to stop to think uh, in the same way. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I think there will always be scenarios, uh, and, and there are various technical reasons why, where uh, an AI may be slow in a certain portion to generate, whether it has to retrieve information or something else. And you can imagine then leaning on the protocol that I've just talked about to buy itself time of hmm, or let me think, or um, and, and it'll just seem very natural uh, when it all comes together. I and and. At the same time, I can see many people recognizing this is an AI voice that's throwing in those those interconnected pieces and criticizing it for it, saying, well, it doesn't need to do that. We need to do that because we're human, but it doesn't need to do that. Yet at the same time, like maybe if we're if we allow ourselves to kind of move beyond that, maybe that ends up making the conversation feel more like something we're used to. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a it's a weird line there. I think I think you can't please everybody as far as that's concerned. <laughs> well, we're we're now in this new sort of v two world, I, I think, and I, I think we're we'll be figuring out exactly how should mm. we map uh, you know these things from human conversation into how how AI should interact. I think it's going to be fascinating. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're doing our own modeling. Uh, you know, I think, you know, it'd be great to see how GPT-4 works out with the, with the voice mode. But yes, I, I think that, you know, there's a not too distant, you know, future where you be able to close your eyes and, you know, wonder, am I talking to a person or talking to, to an AI? And I, I think that will actually be extremely enabling uh, and potentially uh, helping uh, technologies like ChatGPT really cross the chasm and appeal to a much broader sense of people because all you have to do is talk to it. Yeah. Yeah, just fascinating work. Just it is fascinating. It really is. And, uh, and, just, and, and let yeah. us note that this comes right about the same time that ICQ is being shut down. Right. So there's there's kind of oh. a it's really a next generation <laughs> of human chat. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're done with you, ICQ. We've moved on. We yeah, we don't on. we don't need that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Although yeah, it, it will be missed. <laughs> I mean, that, that was a very interesting, sort of one of the first startups of the, these, those guys. I knew them uh, and, and they, they basically are running like six servers in a closet with their original <laughs> data center. Yeah. And uh, they made a lot of trade-offs to kind of make that work. But uh, yeah, really an incredible achievement. Yeah, no, no kidding. Made a lasting uh, imprint on everything on the web, communication on the web. Justin, thank you so much for um, hanging out with us a little bit and telling us a little bit about Fixie and, and uh, AI.town. Um, Fixie.ai is the, is the site. Like I know you do more than just AI Town, you know, and the technology behind that. Maybe maybe just real quick before we say goodbye, tell us a little bit about a, a like a project or two that you're working on outside of AI.town with Fixie. Uh, so I, I think one thing I'll talk about is uh, this new thing. Uh, two things we're doing. One is uh, Ultravox.ai. This is our speech AI model. Uh, we've just open sourced this and, and released it. Uh, we are building a community around it, and in, in some ways. Uh, it could be seen as the open source complement to, to GPT-40, that we're leaning on some of the work that Meta has done using Llama 3 and build a, sort of a front end for this uh, multimodal extension of, of Llama 3 that can consume speech uh, and can be used in things like AI Town uh, to, to get that sort of really fast human type of interaction where it can understand speech natively. And so we've uh, started up a you know, this sort of open source project around this and have had a lot of interested people who are you know, very, very, very interested to see open source have the same sort of abilities that proprietary models like, like GPT-4.0 have. Right the other right. thing is uh, we, we care a lot about speed. And so we've kept a leaderboard of uh, models at the fastest.ai. Um, this is our, our sort of way of, you know, <laughs> keeping track of who's doing an amazing job on making LLM super fast that we can work in these low latency situations we just talked about for voice. Uh, there are a number of familiar names there, but like, we yeah. were working closely with some of these partners on you know, empowering AI town. And you know, we hope to sort of see that these numbers continue to go down. We're also going to add a voice category to, to this as well. Uh, so we can see like, who's doing a great job on actually a multimodal voice. So we care about speed. We care about voice. And like that goes into pretty much everything that is we do. Love it. 
That's great. Well, that's amazing. You're doing great work. You continue to do great work. I will continue to follow you, of course, Justin Uberti, uh, Fixie.ai. You can find the, the links to the few other projects that uh, Justin just mentioned at that site. And then, of course, AI.town. If you want to have some conversations with some AI characters and you can have, you know, you, it, it's like you have a phone conversation with them. It's really cool. It's worth checking out. Uh, Justin, thank you for doing the work that you do. And thanks for talking to us about it. We appreciate your time and appreciate meeting you today. Jason, Jeff, it was great to be here. Yeah, Thanks so appreciate much. it. Uh, best of luck, and we'll uh, talk with you soon. All right, and Jeff, that is it for this week's episode. Gutenbergparenthesis.com for everything Jeff has going on right now. I can show it here real quick just so that people know that it's a site that exists with, with magazine codes. With discount codes, magazine, and then, of course, the big kahuna, the Gutenberg Parenthesis. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Next week, we actually talk with um, someone who, who you know, Nikita Roy from mm -hmm. the Newsroom Robots podcast. She's going to join us, and I give you three guesses what that conversation will be about. That's right. <laughs> Newsroom and AI. That's what we do around here. Uh, sometimes it'll be great to have Nikita on. Uh, AI Inside normally records live every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern here on the Techsploder YouTube channel at youtube.com slash at Techsploder. But I am still away on vacation. Uh, so instead, you can find a YouTube premiere for each for this and which has already passed and then the next two episodes. So just go to that channel at the same time and you will see a premiere that you can do a live chat with people um, as it plays for you. Uh, we will publish it, of course, to our podcast feed later in the day. We can also uh, you can support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash AI inside show where you get a, a whole bunch of awesome perks and you can also be, you know, have the opportunity to be an executive producer of the show, which gets your name called out at the end, like Dr. Do, Jeffrey Maricini, and WPVM 103.7 in Asheville, North Carolina. One of these days, I'm going to like find a way to listen to that on the radio to see, because now I'm super curious. Thank you for your support, y'all. And thank you. Uh, just go to AIinside.show for everything that we have talked about today. It's all published there. Uh, everything you need to know. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We'll see you next week on another episode of AI Inside. Bye, everybody.